You are welcome to this brief introduction to chapter 15 of the New Testament book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, reading from the New Revised Standard Version, updated edition. Text between square brackets represents variant manuscript readings from the 5th century CE or earlier. The Jerusalem Council. Must Gentiles become Jews to be saved? Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. In a Bible study group, pose this query. How do false doctrines enter churches? In this text, false doctrines entered the churches through recognized teachers believed to have authority, for these men had come from Judea, presumably with authority from the apostles and elders of the Jerusalem church. Then discuss, what are some current non-biblical salvation requirements taught by some churches? There are some who say, you cannot be saved unless you go forwards in a public meeting, or you say the sinner's prayer, that is, a specified formula, or you must stop all sinning. Others say, you must also keep the Ten Commandments. Some churches say, you must be baptized. Others be baptized by our clergy, and even others, you must be baptized by immersion in water. There are those who add to this, you must speak in tongues, or believe in certain doctrines, especially regarding creation or the end times. And then there are those who say you must reject certain doctrines, especially those taught by other denominations. And after Peter and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. In a discussion group, pose this query. What is the first step to counter false teaching in churches? In our text, the first step was to debate the issue. What is the next step if the first fails? It is to hold a conference with theologians who are recognized by your denomination, your church, or your church leaders. The Greek text reads, quite literally, the apostles and elders. The definite article, the, is not repeated with elders. So in this verse, those called apostles and elders are viewed as a single class or a same group of men. Then ask, why was Paul's apostolic authority not decisive in this situation? Some points to consider. Was Paul an apostle to the church at Antioch? Did Paul yet recognize his own authority to reveal doctrine from Jesus Christ? Was there something more important here than merely Paul's apostolic authority? What about respect for the other apostles, especially those who had been with the Lord Jesus during his time on earth? So they were sent on their way by the church, and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers and sisters. The conversion of the Gentiles is recounted in chapters 13 and 14, how non-Jews had come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Discuss this query in your study group. Why take time to report about Gentile conversion in both Phoenicia and Samaria? Well, historically, both of those regions had large Gentile populations. The indigenous Phoenicians 
and the Gentile immigrants into Samaria. Why would Jewish Christians who knew the Tanakh, that is, the Old Testament, rejoice over Gentiles becoming Christians? Well, the conversion of Gentiles to the faith of the God of the Bible had long been predicted in their prophets and was now coming to pass. Verse 4. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them, that is, with Paul and Barnabas. In the Greek, there are three entities mentioned, literally, the church, the apostles, and the elders. How are these groups distinct? How do they relate each to the others? They are all three connected by the conjunction chi, 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 and all three have the definite article. Possibly, we could translate this, they were welcomed by the church, including the apostles and the elders. Verse 5. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, It is necessary for them to be circumcised and ordered to keep the law of Moses. For this is what Jews used to require of Gentiles who converted to Judaism. Pharisees, remember, are theologically, morally, and politically conservative. Who today in your country resembles them? The Greek here employs three continuous present tense, implying that, implying that it is always necessary for Gentiles to get circumcised after conversion, and church leaders should continually order them to keep the law of Moses, that is, to observe most of its requirements. Discuss together, what was the Pharisees' logic? Did they believe that since the law came from God, that God requires all human beings to observe this law, and any who converted to Judaism must likewise observe the law? And if those becoming Christians were in some way coming into faith in the God of the Bible, then should they not observe God's law? Then what would be the effect of their ideas if applied to cross-cultural missionary work? If all Gentiles historically were required to adopt Jewish culture, Jewish practices, Jewish forms, then Gentiles would have to go through two conversions, one to Judaism and then a second conversion to Jesus Christ. And in missionary work, we would have to require everyone in every culture group to become Jews in order to become Christians. Verse 6, the apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice amongst you that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. Discuss this query. Why did the apostles not simply dictate a correct teaching? Well, consider John 16, 13, where Jesus had promised that the Holy Spirit would come and would reveal all truth to the apostles. And so the apostles had to hear from the Holy Spirit. And how did they hear from the Holy Spirit? Well, in this chapter, we have one such example. Why include mere elders in the discussion along with the apostles? Well, the elders likewise had been appointed by the apostles and were men full of the Holy Spirit who likewise could exercise a prophetic ministry, and the apostles felt it was important for both them and the church to hear from the elders as well. When Peter said, God chose me, he was referring to two possible events. First, in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus had specified that Peter 
would open the doors of the kingdom of God to those on earth, an authority he also gave to the other apostles. And then in Luke 24, 46, he was told that this message of the gospel would go to all the nations. Then in Acts chapter 10, the Holy Spirit revealed to Peter that he was not to treat Gentiles as in any way unacceptable to God and that he was to violate Jewish regulations by entering into the home of a Gentile, Cornelius, who then became a Christian believer along with his household and many of his friends. Thus it was Peter who opened the kingdom to the Jews on the day of Pentecost and to the Gentiles in the home of Cornelius. According to Peter, what did Gentiles have to do in order to become Christians? In verse 7, the Gentiles must hear the message of the good news and become believers. That is all that is required. Hear the good news and believe it. Verse 8, And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us Jews, and in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. That is, the Gentiles became believers without first becoming Jews. So, what does God do for all who put their faith in Jesus? Well, first, he testifies to them by giving to them his Holy Spirit. That is, the Spirit of Jesus comes and dwells in you and with you. Secondly, he cleanses their heart by faith. That is, they begin to think and to believe and to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. He does this for Jews and for Gentiles without distinction. Discuss this query. What is an implication of this truth for evangelism and for missionary work today? What can we promise to those with whom we share the good news? Do they have to convert to our culture? Must they hear the gospel in our language? Must they join our denomination? Verse 10. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. What is it to test God, but to provoke him by opposing first covenant legal requirements to new covenant divine grace? If the Jews themselves had never been able to obey the laws of God perfectly, then how would Gentiles do so? But if Gentiles are saved by simply believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who saves them by grace, then that is also the way that Jews are saved. The yoke was a common metaphor used of a master's instruction given to his disciples to obey. The phrase translated, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus, reads, by grace we believe to be saved. It might be helpful, if your language provides for it, to discuss the tenses of salvation. That is, we were saved when we believed. We have been saved and remain so. We are saved. Furthermore, we are being saved. And eventually, we will be saved at the resurrection. Well, saved from what? and saved unto what? You should be able to lead a discussion in the many things from which you've been saved, from sin, from damnation, from your old manner of life, from slavery to the devil, from demon infestation, however your culture expresses sin. And saved unto what? 
consider forgiveness, new life, everlasting life, future resurrection from death, participation in the coming kingdom of God, enjoying friendship with Jesus forever. And what is grace? Grace is God's love that gives freely to willing receivers. Jesus secured our salvation by his own death and resurrection, and he did so on behalf of Jews and Gentiles alike. Verse 12. The whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them amongst the Gentiles. Again, we have the Greek phenomenon of hendiades, two words connected by and for a singular idea. The phrase signs and wonders can be translated wonderful signs. So then, ask this, why did they talk about wonderful signs? Well, the Jewish believers had seen wonderful signs done through Peter and the apostles at Jerusalem, and now the same kinds of wonderful signs had been performed through Paul and Barnabas amongst Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first looked favorably upon the Gentiles to take from amongst them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets as it is written. Well, before we read what was written, be sure to discuss who was James. Was he an apostle of the Lord Jesus? Or he was he James, the brother of Jesus, who became an elder in the church at Jerusalem? Compare Acts 12.1 with James chapter 1. And who was Simeon? Well, that's another form of the name Simon, the Jewish name of the apostle whom we call Peter or Cephas. A people for his name a Semitic expression, that is, Jews and Gentiles would become one new ethnicity. The phrase for his name means as his own, just as Israel had been God's own people, his people now include Gentiles. When he says Peter's and Paul's messages agreed with the prophets, we must ask, with which prophets? And since he had said, as it is written, we know that he meant the first covenant scriptures, the writing prophets. These include, in the quotations that follow, both Amos and Isaiah. Quoting from the Greek Septuagint, that is the Greek translation of the Tanakh, the Old Testament, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which is fallen, from its ruins I will rebuild it, and I will set it up, so that all other peoples may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord. And then, with an allusion to Isaiah, the Lord is the one who has been making these things known from long ago. Now, if you go back and read Amos chapter 9, in the Hebrew Bible, the Lord had said, I will shake the house of Israel amongst the nations. Remember, Israel had been deported and had never returned to the land by the time of Jesus. But many had come on the day of Pentecost from all of the tribes of Israel. And therefore, he was interpreting the prediction of Amos to refer to the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. So James is finding patterns in the Tanakh that he interprets in support of the gospel. When he refers to the dwelling of David, in Hebrew, this was the seka, a word that means a thicket, or the branches of a thicket, which were used to build huts. And from hut, we think of the term tent, the Greek translation, which can refer to any kind of dwelling, and eventually a house, and house is often used in the Tanakh to refer to 
a king's dynasty. In other words, the fallen family of David was to be rebuilt and set up, which James interprets to refer to the resurrection of Jesus from death. Now, where the Greek Bible and the New Testament say, the rest of human beings, interpreted by James as conversion of the Gentiles, the Hebrew Bible actually says, the remnant of Edom. Well, how do we get from Edom to humanity? Historically, under King David, the country of Edom had been subjected to the Israelites. Now, the Hebrew word for Edom, Edom, comes from the three consonants, Aleph, Dalit, Mem, which, with different vowels, gives us the word Adam, which means humanity, which could then be translated into Greek as human beings. This is important because verses such as Isaiah 45, 22 had said that one day would be saved all the ends of the earth. And Jesus had said, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. So James is finding fulfillment of the prophets and of the teachings of Jesus in the conversion of the Gentiles who have now come to faith in him. Verse 19. Therefore I have reached the decision that we should not trouble these Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from whatever has been strangled and, and from blood. For in every city, for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. So the apostles wrote a letter to the churches explaining their decision. The term decision is literally I judge, or I give my judgment. We might discuss together here what James meant. Did he mean he was giving his own opinion, or a suggestion, or was he expressing the consensus of the apostles and elders, or had he suddenly received a revelation from the Holy Spirit? Trouble here literally reads overly trouble, that is, we will not trouble the Gentiles beyond the following. He used a term that, had, that he knew from the book of 2 Maccabees, which reads, Full permission for the Jews to enjoy their own food and laws, just as formerly, and none of them should be molested in any way for what may have been done in ignorance. To abstain is a Greek middle voice verb, which is a grammatical way of saying that the action is voluntary. It is not a new law for Christians. When he says Moses is read, of course he means the Pentateuch, specifically books written by Moses, and the Tanakh, or Old Testament, generally. These four prohibitions were common in pagan worship. Two of them were especially offensive to God, that is, meals polluted by being eaten in the presence of idols, forbidden in Leviticus chapter 17. Immorality would include prostitution, which occurred in pagan temples, Leviticus chapter 18. The second two, offensive to Jews, included the eating of animals that had been strangled, that is, meat from ritual sacrifices, and from blood, that is, the ritual drinking of blood or the eating of blood sausages, again forbidden in Leviticus chapter 17. By way of conclusion, then, what are some truths that we have learned from Acts chapter 15? You should be able to point to verses that underscore the following, that Jews and Gentiles alike are saved by grace through their faith alone, that Jews and Gentiles alike have received God's Holy Spirit, and they still do. Thirdly, Gentiles do not have to become Jews to be saved. Fourthly, 
Gentiles ought to avoid pagan practices that offend God and Jews. In doctrinal disputes, let everyone tell their own view, and then let recognized leaders render their decision. And lastly but not least, prophetic scriptures and the apostles' teaching remain our basic test of all truth statements. May the Lord Jesus Christ grant you all wisdom in believing and in teaching others to do likewise.